Yeah. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good morning and good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, so we are here back again uh, with our analysts, Dr. Binia Misgun and Dr. Stanislav Mezenzev. Uh, we were here the last time to analyze uh, the, uh, about Eritrea, the Horn of Africa, and related to also Russia. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion. We got a very good feedback from our viewers. Uh, so they have joined us again, uh, but this time to talk about uh, uh, about the Horn of Africa, which is an interesting region uh, right now, I mean, in our planet, I would say. Uh, and in generally, so what, what we are going to do is uh, we are, they are going to analyze for us uh, for the past uh, six decades uh, how this region has been evolved, in, including both you know the countries in the region and as well the foreign actors uh, uh, involved uh, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, so welcome. Thank you, Mahalet. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Mahalet. We are happy to be here with you again. It is, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here. Just to say a quick word uh, about my guests. Uh, so uh, Dr. Stanislav Mezenzev, he's a senior researcher uh, at Institute for African Studies of the Russian Science uh, Academy. He's a specialist in Horn of Africa. And as well, you all know Dr. Biniam, he's a family of Connect Africa and Dr. Stanislav is also now a member. Uh, yeah, Dr. Binems is a senior researcher at KwaZulu Natal University in South Africa. Uh, he specialized in development studies, but also Horn of Africa, um, movement of people, integration. All this has been, uh, you know, his passion and under his uh, research. So, um, Without further ado, we go straight to uh, the discussion. Let me start with, uh, I would, I, I see according to how I see you here on the screen. Uh, let me start with Dr. Uh, Stan Slav. Um, tell us, you know, during the Cold War, how did the Horn of Africa region, particularly Somalia and Ethiopia became a battleground uh, in the geopolitical struggle uh, between uh, the then USSR uh, and the United States. Uh, what were the key dynamics and implications of the struggle in the region? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. This is a very important question uh, which will allow us to see the Horn of Africa importance. And as you correctly said, we will try to see the history of 60 years. And it's important to start from the Cold War era and to understand the development and uh, what exactly answering your question. I would say that during the Cold War, the Horn of Africa was constantly affected by unexpected and very dramatic and sudden conflicts and tense ideological contradictions, territorial dispute, cross-border dispute, destabilization, and continuous militarization of the region. All of this bad input was the part of the big struggle between two superpowers by that time, mm -hmm. Soviet Union and the United States. And uh, According to the prominent authors and the analytics and the experts at that time called the Horn of Africa either a crisis zone or a mere battleground between the United States and the Soviet Union, exactly like you mentioned when you start this, our uh, today conversation. Yeah, the two superpowers were not only deeply involved in the regional states, political uh, and the security affairs, but also consistently encouraged the escalation of the regional arms race in the Horn of Africa. And uh, the question, why was the, all this, why was it for about, and you know, today, even today, like 150 years ago, not only 60, but all the history of the opening of the Suez Channel, the main advantage and the main misfortune of the Horn remains its extremely advantageous geographical 
geopolitical, a geostrategical position. This was the reason why at that time the superpowers fought each other, despite of interest of the Horn of Africa countries. And, you know, as I already said, from the time when the Suez ch uh, Channel was opened in 1896, the Red Sea became one, and it still remains one of the main transport and logistic arterias of the world importance. Of course, uh, when we had a situation when the world was ruled by two superpowers, USA from the one side and the uh, Soviet Union from another, uh, they both tried to compete each other, first of all, to get military presence, to establish and develop. And uh, it is uh, no coincidence that the height of the Cold War, and this is exactly 70s and 80s of the last century, this region became the, sen the scene of intensive rivalry between the two uh, global powers. And uh, uh, I would say that most of the very important political decision of that time of the Soviet Union government and of the government of the U United States was dictated by the, um, their uh, willingness to get the better position for their military presence, first of all, in the Horn of Africa. For example, uh, it's a very good example to uh, saying this, to support with this example that one of the uh, decisive arguments for in, in favor of the final reorientation of the Soviet Union, what has, has happened in 1966 to 1978, when the Soviet Union, from the support of the Somali, our old friend, the Soviet Union old friend, you remember we signed the first agreements in 1963, then we, we signed in the 70s, full defense agreement with the Siad Barre. Siad Barre, our young uh, listeners, maybe they don't remember. It was a great uh, Somalian, great, it's maybe uh, doubtful. It's, it was uh, one of the dictator who was ruling Somalia by that time. He was a general and he was seeking the uh, support and military, uh, of course, first of all, military support of the Soviet Union. And that in 70, in, uh, end of 70s, Siad Barre made a political uh, mistake, the biggest geopolitical mistake. He decided to rebuild, uh, he has a concept of Great Somalia, you know, this very dangerous concept to which uh, there is a belief that, it's not only belief, it's really the Somalians, the Somalian tribes, they are living there, they, historically they lived in Ogaden, it's a uh, part of Ethiopia, they lived in Kenya, in Somalia as well, and um, in Djibouti. And uh, so the decision of Siad Barre was to reestablish the Great Somalia, and he started the very unprecedented war against the Ethiopia. Uh, that war was known as Ogaden War. And during this period, Soviet Union uh, reoriented their political approach to the Horn. Left Siad Barre and moved all the military assistance from Somalia and moved it to just newly came to power another well-known dictator, but by that time he was a young major then lieutenant colonel of the Ethiopian army, Mangistu Halim Ram, who declared that uh, he will build now socialism and communism. And uh, in reverse, he asked to support him militarily against the Somali because Somalian army was approaching and uh, was uh, defeating and uh, was offensive against, and almost Ogaden was occupied. And you know, after the revolution of in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian army was weak, there were no resistance. And in this time, Soviet Union decided to change completely from Somalia to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is bigger, but uh, they told the Mengistu the condition that we would help you, but 
you have to kick off the Americans from your territory. So it was that rivalry, that battle between two superpowers. And Mengistu uh, shut down the uh, American military base around Asmara in Eritrea. It's Kegin New Station. It was very important for the United States uh, reconnaissance and operational, uh, but Mengistu was in the situation when he uh, was to to choose the site, and he chosen the Soviet Union. Then the Soviet Union won the game, and what I think it was the last big victory of the Soviet Union against American and geopolitical. I mean, and that struggle between them too. And it was happened exactly in the Horn of Africa, and it was affected Ethiopia and Somalia. So that was situation which was finally brought the bipolar world to the collapse, together with Ethiopia to be collapsed, and Ethiopia to became, oh, sorry, Somalia to became failed state. So with this, I want to uh, finalize my answering for the first question, saying that the Cold War era showed us that, unfortunately, the when the interest of African countries are not uh, in the conclusion, but the superpower come to preserve their own interest, it will definitely, it would bring the collapse of, of the system. So no longer Soviet Union is there. Uh, Americans now reestablish their presence, but we will talk later about this, what is happening today at the Horn. But the Cold War era showed again, like I said, 150 years, only the excellent geostrategic position of the Horn was their problem. Now it's changing for the better, but we will talk later on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that background, uh, Dr. Stanislav. Now let's go to uh, Dr. Biniam, or rather, brother uh, Biniam. Um, how has uh, the Eritrea's geopolitical position uh, in the Horn of Africa before independence and after independence uh, has evolved over time? What are like the key factors that have shaped Eritrea's relationship with the neighboring countries and external actors? I'm sure we have talked this or touched mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we discussed before uh, under several topics, but it's good as a background for our viewers really to mm -hmm. start with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, my late. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, the doctor has already laid out some of the most important elements that needed to be considered. You know, where global powers have tried to reshape uh, and organize states in, in our region for their strategic advantage yeah? or perceived strategic advantage. And it's very important to recognize that uh, Africa is a uh, uh, horn of Africa is also very much related to the Middle East. Yeah, what we call the West Asia. I think the most appropriate phrase would be West Asia. Yeah. So uh, the the U.S. Uh, after emerging more or less a vector in the second, you know, the since the Second World War, uh, it wanted to have a footstep in the continent. In fact, it had been eager to establish that kind of uh, 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 control in some of the areas in, the, in, in Africa, but unable to do so because uh, those states were already affiliated to their uh, 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 colonial masters. And in and, 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 and its attempt to establish its foot, it realized that there are spaces where uh, weaker uh, points. Remember, if you look at Eritre Eritrea and Somalia, they were Italian colony and Italy was defeated already. So, and, and when Italy was defeated, America just found a very important uh, uh, entry point. And the first came to Eritrea in 1943, when the British military administration established its, its base in Eritrea uh, after defeating the Italians in Eritrea. And, and there they established what, they, what we call the Ganyo Station, yeah? And it was a very important spy station. Initially, they did not realize the significance of this, but it was just a radio gathering, information gathering station. But then it turned out to be very useful, so. And, 
they started to pursue it. So they brought in King Haile Selassie into the uh, Quincy, U.S. West Quincy. You know, the President Roosevelt brought him uh, into that ship and decided that, you know, you're going to be our ally and we're going to uh, 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 merge Eritrea and Somalia with Ethiopia and you're going to be the anchor. And, and that was in February uh, uh, 13, 1945. And, and more or less at the same time as well, you have also uh, uh, an oil exploration company, Sinclair Oil uh, Corporation, I think it was called, but it is a Sinclair Oil uh, Petroleum Company. And it, it had been doing a lot of exploration work in the region and found a huge reserve of gas and oil in Ogade region, and it was then so Somalia, yeah? And the Brits had been in control of that area. So, and it is, uh, this company is also affiliated to the UK and the US. So it was very important, and it wrote a letter to a number of influential uh, uh, senators at the time, trying to find a way to merge Eritrea and Ethiopia, and then of course Somalia too. So this is the background that, you know, uh, 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 the U.S. tried to establish its, its uh, 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 foot in the Horn of Africa. But then Eritreans started to show resistance against this. Yeah, we want our independence in the manner in which other uh, uh, former Italian colonies were uh, 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 receiving their independence. So it didn't work out, yeah. Uh, so the you know uh, the the federation came into play, uh, and Haile Selassie willingly also dismantled the federation in order to annex Eritrea altogether. So this is the background, and then the, you know the tension between Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia begins because of those kinds of overlaps. Yeah, now. Uh, uh, land, Somali is being incorporated into Ethiopia, Eritrea being incorporated into uh, Ethiopia again, the, the, those tensions started to swirl and it's a, an attempt to maintain its influence and then people from below uh, are resisting it as well. And then comes the, U, uh, the USSR, the uh, Soviet Union, and it found its way more or less slowly Remember, I did mention in the in the in the past that uh, uh, you, uh, Soviet Union uh, was the one that built the oil refinery in Assam, and Haile Selassie requested uh, 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 the Americans to build oil refinery. When by then America had already established a strong relationship with Saudi Arabia, so they went and consulted their regional partners. And Saudis and the Saudis said, No, we want to do it ourselves. So, you know, we don't want to allow this to happen there. Yeah. Remember, it, er, Ethiopia uh, has oil, well recorded and uh, recognized oil, but then they wanted to maintain it as a reserve basically for when oil is becoming very much scarce. Yeah. That's the kind of arrangement that they had. And then the Haile Selassie uh, uh, administration then decided to engage the Russians and the Russians. I mean, the Soviet Union, uh, obviously, back then, uh, 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 agreed to build it. And that's how slowly that uh, relationship started to mature, even though Russia had established a relationship with Ethiopia way long uh, uh, before that. Yeah, uh, uh, There's something, a relationship that has gone for over 100 years, Yeah, uh, a diplomatic relationship that has been established over a long period of time. But then came the critical moment when the Dirk was the uh, 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 where Dirk took power from King Haile Selassie in 1974 and wanted America to support some of its programs yeah uh, but then Dirk was already occupied by the so-called progressive movements and many of them uh, uh, Marxist and communist yeah uh, uh, and therefore wanting Ethiopia to become a socialist state. So that kind of tension started to uh, 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 embroil Ethiopia in the kind of confrontation with the US and eventually, you know, uh, Ethiopia decided to go uh, to align itself with this, uh, you know, the communist socialist uh, state uh, at the time. So heading to the Soviet Union. And that upset, uh, upset America and America 
then uh, decided to uh, uh, support what uh, uh, the US, uh, uh, what the uh, Soviet used to support uh, 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 and Somalia. So playing one state against the other had been one of the ways that they had managed this relationship, yeah, which is a very problematic one. And I remember when you see the, the picture, the geography of those states, it's interlinked in many respects. And then you have those uh, 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 coastal areas, if you look at them, and they're very strategic in many respects. So if you have control over those three states, then you would have control over the sea as well as the hinterlands and the and the continent as well. The, so the, the, the session that those are gateways to, to the continent. At the same time, also uh, places where you would project power uh, in the in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean uh, uh, part of that uh, area. So, it, it is in this kind of competition then we started to see uh, global powers supporting one over the other. Yeah, uh, uh, and 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 of course uh, uh, the the. Uh, the in 1991, when Eritrea got independence, remember, America did not want this independence. I know many Ethiopians think that America supported Eritrean independence. To the end, they, they, the assumption in the Americans were that Ethiopia would come back to us. Yeah, We just must make sure that you know we handle it carefully. That's the kind of argument that they used to have. And I think there are a number of... Uh, 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 written materials to support that, uh, the, uh, the, those kinds of conversations that they had. And in 1991, when Eritrea got its independence, Americans did not even like that because they wanted Eritrea to play a role and continue to be a federated state of some sort, you know, to continue with Eritrea. And then, of course, the, uh, the uh, uh, EPLF at the time did not want that. So slowly then they realized that they have to work with the TPLF that came to power with the support of EPLF and then somehow find a way to get them to fight against each other. So, I mean, there are claims that, you know, this border tension that, that started in 1997 was actually manufactured and attained to somehow create a rift between those two states. If they start working together, then it's going to be a different uh, 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 scenario in the region. And that they did not like. And then, of course, Eritrea had been keen to establish... Uh, a, co a cooperation of progressive leaders uh, from Rwanda all the way to uh, uh, Chad. And that's the assumption that, uh, you know, ambition that they had. Uh, this, this could be done. We could establish integration in the region and, you know, pursue our own independent path. And obviously the U.S. emerging as the, the victor in the, uh, in the, in the, in the so-called uh, Cold War, uh, uh, or perceived to have won the Cold War wanted to assert its position and therefore the only way to do this is you know find a way to break this alliance and then somehow manage Eritrea by isolating it weakening it and eventually trying to turn it into uh, 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 something that they can manipulate to their perceived strategic advantage now just to add to that remember in the 19 45, the U.S. wanted Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia to be one big country that the U.S. would use as anchor in the region. But then when Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia independently want to establish a, 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 a cooperation, the first state that, you know, fought against that was the U.S. So why, why is that? Then when we want to do it on our own terms, then it's not acceptable to the U.S. But then when they want to impose it on us, then it was, it was acceptable. So we need to understand those... Sorry, sorry. Yeah? Sorry. So just, just a final note. Uh, 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 it is very fine. important. Yeah, it's sorry. Fine. We, we, no it problem. Important. We keep it real here, so no problem. Yeah. Go. I apologize. So it is very important to remember this, 
the the region is rich with resource and as well as it is very strategic. And of course, Kainyo became irrelevant when and it was at top of the hill of the world. And that's why they could establish a spy station. That element was the, initially what they noticed. But then later on, resource is very important. The rate sea is very important. And the projecting power from the Indian Ocean was very important. And with all other resources that combined, uh, and the strategic, geostrategic relevance of the region was very important to all powers, and including now emerging powers and the traditional global powers continue to jostle, you know, for influence. Uh, and I think I leave it, and then we can expand the discussion a bit further as we go along. Thank you very much, Brother Bini. I'm, I, 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 I'm glad I asked that question, although I thought it might be repetitive for those who have been listening. Our uh, discussion in the past, uh, meaning, you know, uh, me and you, uh, we several, uh, several times we've talked about it, but this was different. Uh, it gives, in a way, an understanding, uh, you know, how meaningful it will be if this initiative actually work this trilateral initiative uh, of the Ethiopia, Somalia uh, and Eritrea, you know, considering historically how they have been, uh, uh, how the foreign actors tried, uh, tried or exploited uh, the country and creating conflict amongst, uh, amongst uh, within these countries. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Now, let's make a, a fast forward and I, I will go to Dr. Stanislav to the uh, post-bipolar era. Uh, who are the prominent external actors in the Red Sea region? Specifically, how has China emerged as a major player and what are the geopolitical implications of its presence? Uh, and additionally, if it's not too much, what roles do other significant uh, actors such as uh, the U.S., of course, the, the Middle Eastern countries uh, like UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and now we have Iran as well, uh, play uh, in this uh, in the Red Sea uh, region? Uh, it's for you, Dr. Stansla. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mahalet, for another interesting question, which brings us from the Cold War era to the current uh, situation and uh, what we have in uh, uh, our days here in the Horn, we again have to start <clears throat> answering to your question, just putting two very important figures about the economic importance of the region. And uh, of course, it can't be overestimated. One, because the Red Sea arena is crucial to the global economy and because it's sitting airstride lifeline and global commerce and energy sources that flow between Asia to Europe and back. The Red Sea itself is one of the world's busiest and the biggest uh, waterways with an estimate of 700 up to 800 billion U.S. Uh, cost of goods passing through the bubble mandate and uh, straight uh, bubble mandate straight annually and uh, in around 5 million barrels of oil daily. Of course, um, all our um, current life it depends on the economy and uh, now Soviet Union no longer exists but the new players are coming to the Red Sea arena. And of course, the first of all is China. Even though United States never disappeared and was always present, but for the United States, I think before 2017, uh, since the publication of the Trump administration national security strategy, which they published and announced end of 2017, United States was mostly uh protect their military interest in the horn of africa because you know that uh, americans they have a uh, long time established a military base in djibouti and uh, they took uh, after the uh, french colonial troops the camp Le Manier. now it's the biggest 
um, military base of the United States in Africa. And this today, it's a headquarter of AFRICOM at a special command of the African Armed Forces. It's combined. It's um, interesting. It's something which emerged after the uh, Cold War era. Today, Americans are trying to uh, establish their military presence, but backed by the USAID and uh, African development project. So they are saying now, we are here militarily, but we are here to prevent the security of the region, but also we are here to help the development of the region. So they change in words and in practice their strategic approach. But even though till 2017, the Americans was leading the role and they were uh, ignorant about the rise of the new superpower who came in our days and became economically not bigger, but almost bigger than the United States is, of course, China. And you know what is interesting, and we are witnessing this in the Horn of Africa. 2017, the China opened the, opened the first ever foreign military base. Because uh, before, China had the defensive strategy. So the Chinese interest was to develop the economy, to be, you know, everywhere, nothing but business. Only economic and economic projects and all so on. But 2017 showed the change of the strategy of the China abroad. And again, we are witnessing here as a first example, again, at the Horn of Africa. And again, why the first military base appeared of China in the Horn of Africa in Djibouti, just a few kilometers from the Cape Lemanier, from the United States Naval and the um, Ground Force base of the AFRICOM, of the United States of America. Because that trade of 700 to 800 billion, what we mentioned, saying about the economic strat strategical position of region. Most of this trade, it's, it's in interest of China. But all the logistic, like 90% of logistic, moving all these goods, it's a Chinese logistic. So definitely for them now, being so deeply involved in uh, this Red Sea route, economically they have to protect that military so that is why chinese opened in 2017 and you know in 2020 the china uh, reconstruct modernize it based and from today from 2020 this naval base can also serve the air carrier of the uh, navy of china and this brings absolutely new picture. And now the United States of America, seeing the Chinese base next to them in Djibouti as a real threat. And of course, they start to get and to understand that they are losing the, their uh, supremacy, supremacy in, the, in the region. And the Chinese, they are acting very quick, you know, uh, we were witnessing, and we, we even discussed with you last time, the few important visit of the Eritrean president to Beijing and to Moscow. And you know, now China is well established in Djibouti. What they are doing, they are developing the infrastructure. First of, of course, first of all, it is commercial uh, sea port infrastructure in Eritrea. But definitely there is a signals, there are the signals that uh, they will not uh, stop on the commercial side only, but they will also going to develop some kind of military presence as well. Those taking exactly the position of the Soviet Union, because when the Soviet Union, what we discussed and with Dr. Benjamin mentioned, this uh, presence of the United States at Eritrea was a very important for the balance of force and even to win 
the strategical position in a rivalry or with, with the United States. Now the China is doing the same. On the one hand, they are open for cooperation and also there is a lot of American and European trade in the Red Sea. But on the second hand, they are becoming more and more, uh, I'm not saying aggressive, but they are becoming more and more offensive in their strategic plans. And they also start to using the uh, Horn of Africa countries. Now Djibouti, next Eritrea is coming, I mean, for Chinese. And you see from previous uh, global uh, fight of two superpowers, where I see new two superpowers that are coming and the Horn of Africa again influenced by them. But the difference of the Cold War era and now, it's a, and this is important to mention here in, in your program, that the difference is position and the politics of the African governments, of the government of Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somali, and Djibouti. Now, uh, in comparison with the Soviet Union and the Cold War era, Horn of Africa was used to without any um, fears and about any things of development to paying back to the countries of the Horn. But now both the United States and their European alliance and the China, they came to Horn of Africa understanding that the situation has completely changed because of the changing of the approach and diplomacy and politics of the countries of the Horn. And now all the countries from Eritrea to Somalia and Ethiopia and Djibouti, they are having a lot of opportunities because they now can uh, negotiate the continuous relations with the superpowers only if they will accept the position of the Africans. And it is good and it gives a lot of opportunities for the Horn of African countries because from bystanders or from the like the territory to be deployed for the military presence of Cold of uh, Cold War era today these are independent developing countries with their own positions and they are now the partners and they participate in all what these big powers are trying to do on the continent and it's it gives, as I already said, and I want to mention again, gives a lot of economic opportunities. And the China uh, building up their one road, one belt strategy, which their strategic initiatives in the going from the Red Sea, I think, to the South Africa in the future. But now main area of development is exactly Horn of Africa. And it brings a lot of opportunities for the Horn of Africa uh, countries, which definitely they will be using for the wealth and for the good of the development of their economies. And uh, we will see in the very near future a lot of new projects, a lot of new investment, especially now uh, in regards with Somali, because it's the most undeveloped and very still very unstable country and for the Eritrea which now has started new new era of development and the uh, visit to uh, visit of the president of Eritrea is as ever for working to Beijing showed a lot of opportunities for the Eritrea and because now Ethiopia and Eritrea are uh, slowly but reluctantly coming to some kind of uh, federal cooperation or government-to-government uh, -government cooperation, it will be serving a lot for the Ethiopia, which we all know that 150 million population suffered without the seaports. It's very important that Eritrea is opening up. And the Chinese, with their infrastructure investment, they will very quickly develop the port of Asap, and it will be now uh, competitor with the Djiboutian port. 
On the other hand, we, we have a Somali, which is now uh, Somaliland and uh, Magadisha. They are, it's uh, uh, both they are under influence of different also powers. And we have also to be very careful to see what will be happening very soon in Somali. Because as you ask the other question, who are the players? Other players is uh, Middle, uh, Middle East countries, first of all, Saudi Arabia and Emirates. They are also coming to Red Sea because Red Sea becomes like the Horn of Africa. Is, we cannot no longer see it as an in, independent region. It's a part of the big Red Sea region or Red Sea arena. And the, of course, for the Emirates, they are very much depend on the traffic and logistics through the seaports of Africa. You know, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, Emirates entities, DP World, is the biggest company owned by the Emirates. They bought the Somaliland port of Berbera. And they invested one billion US dollar to develop the free zone. And they are developing very uh, so fast and so quickly that most of the businesses from Ethiopia now moving from Djibouti to Somaliland, to Berbera, to free zone, to the new established free zone. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's more effective. So what I'm trying to say, finalizing my part of the analyzing, that involvement of the foreign powers now is very different when it was previously, because it brings economic development and brings economic opportunities, which now will help the development of countries of the Horn of Africa. There are, of course, still some risks uh, and challenges. We can discuss them a little bit later. But in generally, the geostrategical unique position of the Horn now bringing finally more evidence back to the population of these countries than it was ever before. So and we wish that this process will continue and will development and especially integration within the horn will be the basic or the basement to overcome the crisis to stabilize the situation in Somalia and uh, in the region as a whole. Only through the development it can be this issue can be solved. Yeah, I think thank you this Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stanislav, really, uh, for that uh, explanation, the involvement in the, of all those uh, foreign actors. I think almost everyone from all the regions of uh, the world that are there. And uh, yeah, China through the time as well, how it involved. Um, let's go to uh, Brother Biniam. Uh, now that in our reasoning, both of you, we have established that fact, the importance of the region and for the past six decades, how why it was restless. Uh, now for Eritrea, um, how does Eritrea plan to leverage its resources and strategic position to foster its economic growth uh, and of course, improve the livelihoods of uh, its people. Um, mm -hmm. What are the specific economic opportunities that Eritrea seeks or Eritrea? Actually, people are correcting me. I should say Eritrea as an Amharic speaker. Uh, Eritrea <laughs> seeks to capitalize on the Horn of Africa. Thank you, Mali. Yeah, uh, I, I, it is. It is obviously premised on. Uh, the understanding that th those areas uh, uh, where we are uh, uh, founding ourselves are uh, crucial to many other external powers, yeah? Uh, the, or the, they see them as very important. But Eritrea's position has been, we would like to actually do it on our own, you know, and use this uh, uh, by ways of uh, building a decent neighborhood, yeah? A cooperative neighborhood. So uh, uh, it, it starts. It starts with this assertion that we need to be wary of other powers having a base in a similar fashion that they have established in Djibouti. Then they're going to drag us into their conflict and rivalry, you know. And then our uh, area might 
uh, be exposed to the kind of proxy war yeah, uh, uh, that we had seen in the past. And that's a kind of assertion here you had. And then in, a, in, a step, in, 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 in uh, suggesting a proposal for uh, uh, the Red Sea Forum, for example, Eritrea wanted all the regional states to be the primary uh, players in that, yeah, primary players in regulating and monitoring, and and the same thing in the uh, Horn of Africa region as well. We need to be leading the process, and I think that's what Eritrea has been playing. And then, of course, this is not to say that we are going to live in isolation, but then we want to engage with Russia, we want to engage with China, we want to engage with Europeans and Americans as well. We have a lot to offer, and then they, are, they have also contributions. So that's the kind of uh, premise that Eritrea has. And obviously, it wants to leverage its uh, uh, marine uh, 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 resource, yeah, uh, the fact that it is, you know, on the Red Sea coast, it wants to uh, be able to uh, benefit from the trade that is happening in that region. You know, the, the logistics that is transported in the Red Sea uh, uh, via Red Sea, Eritrea wants to be able to uh, harness that potential and be able to use yeah, a, a logistics hub and uh, and of course, marine resources there, you know, fishing and, and the rest. Ecotourism is also a very important aspect to it. Mining is there, potash. Uh, potash is, I think, you know, we have come to realize how strategic that resource is because uh, much of the fertilizer and the world food production is, uh, is to be supported by uh, increasingly this kind of uh, uh, extraction and then how accessible that is. To, because Eritrea is closer to the Red Sea. So this is what Eritrea thinks that it could bring the, to the table. And then this can be also used in order to link, you know, the, the, the regional states within that as well, yeah? Uh, uh, and in many respects, uh, trading within each other and working with each other. Uh, and, and obviously, the, the uh, many people think uh, talk about the, the, the Eritrean, uh, uh, ports being accessible to Ethiopia, but it's not just Ethiopia, but Sudan with the port that it has, it needs also to use Eritrean ports. As its economy started to grow, and it's going to need more and more port access. And Ethiopia, obviously, is not going to just sit, uh, depend on uh, uh, Djibouti. Djibouti is not going to sustain it. Therefore, it's going to need Somalia, it's going to need Kenya, it's going to need two of Eritrea. So it depends on the, which part of the geography, you know, economic values must be considered, you know. And as we get more integrated, you know, through infrastructure and other uh, uh, important uh, 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 networks that facilitates this kind of interaction, then this can even go all the way to South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and it can go all the way to even West Africa, because why would you have to transport goods via sea and taking them all the way uh, through the Suez Canal, go to the Mediterranean, and rather you would have this resource, uh, to, uh, uh, this uh, 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 logistics be transported via train or uh, 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 tracks, yeah, send them all the way, and it takes fewer resources away from you to be economically more sensible to do that. And then I think as those economies started to grow, and that's the kind of future that that region would have. And then Eritrea is actually looking at it as a long term, you know, to, you know, looking at it 20, 30 years, this is where this region is going to go. And then this is the kind of role we would like to play in that in that region. And of course, Chinese BRI, as, as Eritrea has uh, 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 formulated it as part of its proposal, then it, this is the kind of objectives that it has and set targets that it has for itself. And of course, it's not just you know the trade aspect, but agriculture is also very important for Eritrea and it wants to develop its agriculture. Food security continues to be a pressing uh, 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 agenda they and Eritrea, as you know, so it want to also enhance that aspect. Uh, so uh, this kind of cooperation between other powers it has uh, it has been a very important one uh, 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 for Eritrea, including you know the regional mini powers such as UAE or even Saudi Arabia. Yeah, 
uh, and and mining has been something that's you know it's been discussed but all Eritrean mining began with the European uh, owned by European West what the West in general you know uh, some of them registered at the Lord London Stock Exchange but then with this harassment of the US many of them had to go to uh, uh, to ch to the Chinese yeah uh, uh, and still Eritrea doesn't mind, you know, other actors, other mining actors uh, investing in Eritrea. And there's a lot of potential there as well. And of course, it's about resource and capacity that uh, uh, that we have to constantly work with in relation to those states uh, and, and, and investors in those states, uh, while prioritizing local needs and local aspirations, as well as uh, a local uh, developmental objectives, you know, uh, it's not open for uh, in a way that we see in some parts of uh, uh, the continent. And I think this would facilitate in a way also linking Eritrea with the rest of the region, yeah, in the many respects. Eritrea uh, thinks about Portage, not only Eritrea's Portage, but also Ethiopia is also going to develop its Portage, which is sitting next to Eritrea, yeah. And its joint development of that might also necessitate having to work together with 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 Ethiopia. And in addition to the port I'm talking about, oil refinery, you know, it could you could engage with it uh, uh, and interact with the Ethiopian economy as well, and in that way facilitating regional development. And of course, Ethiopia is very central in that. Uh, Con making connection with Somalia, making connection with Djibouti, making connection with uh, uh, with, the, with the, uh, uh, Eritrea, and then of course connecting e Ethiopia would be also connecting other parts of the 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 the, 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 the region, Sudan, South Sudan, Central Africa Republic. All that is also uh, it's via Ethiopia that would be made possible. So this is the kind of broader outlook. Uh, uh, and prospect that Eritrea, I think, has in mind and wants to leverage uh, in, in, the, in the coming years and decades. Yeah, I'll leave it here to Malik. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brother Biniam, really, for that. How beautiful it will be when that day comes that we all in the region uh, be able to use our resources to develop and, you know, uh, yeah, use this strategic. Uh, positions that uh, we have uh, in the world without anyone's exploitation. Uh, yeah. Uh, now let's go. To, of course, there are challenges. What are I mean? Listening now, what you have listed. These are all the things that Eritrea uh, look uh, to leverage. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, in pursuing its economic uh, growth, then one can say, then what is stopping it from using? So we understand there are challenges. But before we go to challenge, let's, uh, let's really talk about uh, the opportunities. I go to uh, Dr. Uh, Stanislav. Uh, considering the unique uh, ge uh, geographic position and resources, of the Horn of Africa, what uh, potential economic opportunities uh, can and should the countries in the region pursue? How can they leverage their strategic location and resources uh, to foster uh, economic growth uh, and development? Uh, uh, then later on, we will discuss the challenge, but yeah, let's, uh, uh, let's pursue now on the, on, on the opportunities. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mahalan. Thank you. You know what? Um, I think that uh, Dr. Binyanim, uh, Binyam already answered uh, this question because what he was saying about Eritrea or Eritrea or Eritrea, yeah, <laughs> it was exactly uh, it was exactly the future opportunities and prosperities for the all all of the region. You know, the uh, as we already mentioned several times that this all this country Eritrea Ethiopia connected to Eritrea the Djibouti and the big country Somalia which is now divided still by some conflicts and uh, some problems that they, they they located at the place which naturally by God brings them an opportunity because 
the trade between Asia and Europe cannot be sustainable without using the seawater of these countries. Only these facts already gives them a lot of opportunities to explore. And as we see the most and very um, easy to take, it's, it's to be part of the logistic net which is building up and which is now reconfiguring, which is developing by the major power, as we mentioned, by the China and the United States of America. To be involved in this development, and yes, and of course, Emirates, don't, we don't forget that they are also biggest operators of the ports of the Africa, and especially Horn of Africa, because as I said, uh, they took the port of Somalia now and they're developing the Chinese in Djibouti and now in Eritrea. So the only what we need as a region, once again, to uh, put back the contradictions and to try to develop the common Horn of Africa uh, approach to develop and to use the opportunities. What is given by nature, by the creator, by the God of, of being on this route. You see, developing these ports, developing of uh, free zone infrastructures is bring uh, developing of the roads, the railways and the track roads to develop the routes deeper into the Africa. What we already mentioned, this is opportunity for the region because me, uh, spending a lot of time in the uh, eastern part of Africa, in Uganda, in the first in Ethiopia, then in Uganda, I can tell you the importance of building this line, logistic line, what also Dr. Binyam has mentioned, using three big ports, one in Eritrea, one in Port of Asap, another one in Djibouti. They, they have five ports now. Four ports and uh, two or three, I think, already now the the uh, on land ports where they put these containers. It's a huge industry now. The Berbera also is coming. The roads and the railways are coming down to Africa, and it brings now to reality that a vision of Pan Africanist of ten years, fifteen years ago, they were dreaming about the. Uh, when the time will come to connect the south, the northern and southern and east and west through the logistic lines. That, you know, the roads, it is well known, it's like the uh, winds for the blood. It brings the development. As soon as the roads constructed, as soon as the goods will go without, because of the uh, African uh, common trade zone, which is now finalized, it will bring a lot of these logistic opportunities, will bring a lot of economic opportunities to develop uh, all other sectors of economy. And of course, we know that the sea, the fish, the uh, fishing, the uh, other natural resources we mentioned potash we know that ethiopia is rich enough with the natural resources the only what is preventing all this it was preventing all this it's instability in the region because investors are afraid of the geopolitical situation never invest before they see that situation stable what we see now of big one billion investment from the emirates came to somaliland I think two or three billion will come now from China to Eritrea to develop this logistic infrastructure. It shows that the stability of the horn is becoming more and more visible. And the work of the government and development of the government of the Ethiopian and the Somali and the Eritrean and Djiboutian government approach to this project became more and more um, acceptable for the international investment. And, and so it all, with the flow of money, with the flow of investment, and brings a lot of 
working place. So it, it gives an opportunities for the horn. The main thing now, what I want to stress once again, finalizing what we were discussing, the horn of Africa are no longer is used by the foreign powers. The horn of Africa now is in the process of cooperation with the other world. And being the United States, being the China, European Union, or Middle Eastern countries, they all now came and they also obliged to be in the partnership, even though China will still compete with the United States. But you remember the current visit of the state secretary to Beijing showed that both countries obliged to find the uh, common grounds and the common and try to understand because the trade war brought both countries to unfavorable positions. And it's interesting that both of them, we, we never mentioned this during uh, uh, our conversation about that visit, both of these countries are very interested to be present in in Africa, and especially in the Horn of Africa. And because even the military, they are present there. They, they both of them, they don't want to any conflict or, or contradiction between them. So they will be more and more careful with all, we hope, with all their moves in, in the Horn. So, and we hope that um, in the nearest future, this competition kind to cooperation brings a lot of more additional value to the Horn of Africa countries. And we wish uh, all these countries all the success because the Horn was suffering so long from, you know, proxy wars where the interest of the countries were not in, in, in the agenda. It was always interest of superpowers from our outsiders. But now the situation changed. My uh, uh, feel and my think and what I can uh, say as an expert, so we are seeing the time region to be developed. Of course, the challenge and the problems will remain, but they will be overcome by negotiations, by cooperation, and now, when the war in Tigray stopped, when the Eritrea signed the peace agreement with Ethiopia, only remaining part is the, some parts of Somalia to be stabilized. But if these three players, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, will come together to the Somali problems, the Somali problems will be solved because now the biggest part of the Horn of Africa is ready to bring the peaceful solution for their neighbors. And this is the only way for going forward. I want to stop on here. Yeah, so sorry. Thank, thank sorry. Thank sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you you have uh, uh, addressed uh, uh, for the question, I think, uh, all the answers as was what you were saying. So let's bring Dr. Bini, I'm here. Uh, thank you, yeah, uh, of course, uh, interesting. Instability, is, that's a key word that I took, instability created uh, by foreign actors. In the region, so that they cannot develop. Uh, Brother Biniam, in light of uh, recent geopolitical developments, how does uh, Eritrea view the involvement of external actors in the Red Sea region? Uh, what are the opportunities and challenges? Uh, of course, you have talked about the opportunities, but the challenges associated with these external engagements, and how does Eritrea navigate uh, them to protect its national interests? Thank you, Marlet. Yeah, I, I think uh, the last the last point uh, mentioned by uh, Doctor, uh, the, and, and you you raised that instability is 
the most important uh, challenge we continue to face. Yeah, look at what's happening in Sudan, and look at what's happening in in uh, South Sudan. Look at what's happening in Somalia. Yeah, the conflict, a tension that is already brewing, well, already raging war between uh, uh, Somaliland and uh, 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 and the Somalia proper. Those are tension and the, the different uh, uh, conflicts that are taking place in Ethiopia. Those are very important uh, issues that we have to look into and be able to address. Yeah, if we don't have a stable neighborhood, all those aspirations we uh, we have, all the different projects that we are considering are not going to materialize. Yeah, exactly. and part of, uh, and part of part of the challenge for us is that. They are intertwined. Both internal and external factors are at play. Uh, the internal contradictions are there, uh, uh, partly uh, because of some uh, uh, some uh, uh, historical uh, uh, relationships that have not been uh, as as great as we would like them to be, or as good as they, we, they were supposed to be, and. The, the bulk of it goes to external interference and in, in order to manipulate them uh, and stop them when they feel like it in order to uh, create wages between the regional uh, states and people. For example, the conflict in, uh, in, in northern Ethiopia was precisely uh, built in order to create a wage between Ethiopia and Eritrea so that they will continue to work with each other. Remember, they were very open about it. They were telling uh, Prime Minister Abi, you need to stay away from Eritrea. Yeah. And political uh, leaders in Ethiopia were constantly being warned that they should not work with, with Eritrea. Why? I mean, what's wrong with uh, with the Ethiopia working with, with Eritrea? Even if Eritrea is considered to be an authoritarian state, they work with many authoritarian states that they have no problem with that. Yeah. So those are those are the issues that we we, we have to uh, somehow uh, address in order for us to unlock those potentials and you know pursue uh, a very uh, 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 forceful uh, integration in the region and, and that would allow us to develop uh, uh, our countries. And remember, those infrastructures are very crucial for us to to develop. Yeah, we cannot just be trading with the rest of the world. We need to be able to trade with each other for us also to, to develop, you know, uh, and uh, become strong uh, as, a, as a region, yeah? And what better countries to integrate in Africa than Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia? The overlaps, the interrelationship that they have, the cultural uh, similarities, yeah? And it could be... Uh, uh, used as as a way to build also uh, 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 bring others into it, and of course the U.S. and its 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 uh, its in, uh, interlocutors were trying to tell us that oh this is going to dismantle uh, uh, EGAD. EGAD was established in those countries and at the same profit, and then there are overlapping. Uh, 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 regional membership as well. For example, Uganda is a member of the East African community, right? As well as a member of ANICA. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, so that, that overlapping membership, and it was established as a cooperation. Anyway, we need to pursue this despite the challenges, yeah? And slowly working both at the economic uh, 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 development and infrastructure integration, as well as establishing the instability. Remember, the, the tripartite agreement was to establish uh, at all levels, so economic integration, uh, work uh, uh, in cooperation in order to bring instability and peace into the region, and a cultural element to it. So th those those we still have to go back to that. You know, we don't need a new invention already. Our leaders have established, you know, what works best for us. Now, the challenge for us has been the U.S. and Western powers wanting to use this kind of proxy war and their competition and rivalry with uh, with China and uh, and Russia. Yeah? Now, we know this is a, a competition for resource and you know and dominance. Yeah, 
uh, uh, of the region. This is a geostrategic region that we have already uh, established. So how do we navigate that without being caught up in and in, in, in becoming uh, their proxies? Yeah? Uh, the only way to avoid that is to actually be independent. Yeah, uh, Don't uh, consign your entire uh, foreign policy on their will and on their uh, resource. Yeah, If you make your foreign policy dependent on their uh, resource and their will, then you are going to have a problem again. Yeah, uh, They tend to use local contradiction. They, they tend to exploit local weaknesses. Remember, uh, the, world, uh, the World Food Program and USAID left Ethiopia at exactly the moment where Ethiopia are, you know, a huge number of Ethiopians are in need of food aid, right? Why do you think that's the case? There had been so many lootings and they had been supplying TPLF, you know, brazenly being uh, used, food aid being used to, uh, to, su uh, to support uh, uh, the armed insurrection that uh, TPLF had pursued for over the last, what, three years now? Closer to three years. They had, they had not stopped it, right? They continued to supply, but now all of a sudden they stopped. Uh, and why are they delaying uh, uh, the, the, I, the IMF and World Bank uh, promises of giving Ethiopia some loan or uh, loan restructuring? Yeah, uh, all that is part of the package that they always utilize. Those are the tools yeah, that they have as a leverage. Uh, in order to manipulate states in the in the region, and then of course we have to be uh, 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 we have to pay attention to those dynamics and see ways of circumventing them. And that's why I, I keep telling you know my colleagues and my friends here, yeah, uh, we need to liberate our leaders because in closed doors they tell they there's so many intimidation, so many. Uh, man, uh, manipulation that is taking place. Uh, liberating our leaders meant we we become the uh, the ones that that shape the narrative from below. In order, our leaders started to see our interest, yeah, and pursue our interest despite the bullying, despite the pressure that is being put on in place on 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 them, yeah. So. Uh, this is very crucial that we we have to find a way to circumvent uh, those kinds of bullying. Yeah, and I I quest, uh, I, 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 all, I have been uh, pointing out Africa might like, might probably be a site for their proxy war. Yeah, and we could see the sign. Yeah, here and there, and then already some incidents are already. Uh, uh, telling, uh, very telling that this is the kind of agenda they have in place for us. Now, people might talk about the generals, the super generals in, in Sudan, but then the external factor must be also something that we have to understand. Remember, America has always thrived on, on crisis. Yeah. Remember what allowed America to come to the horn of uh, the uh, Djibouti was the so-called the pirate crisis or Somali pirates, you know, uh, uh, sabotaging the trade, uh, tra you know, and, and, and negatively impacting the trade routes. And then that allowed, uh, well, provided the excuse for the, you know, other powers to bring in their uh, navy. So America came in and all the others came in, you know, Japan and all of them are there, right? and slowly established the base in Djibouti. Uh, and of course, China also had to do that. You know, it can't just let all the others have a place uh, and not, uh, you know, see it from a distance. So this might eventually trans translate into the kind of revenue. So each crisis would create an opportunity for them to have this kind of influence, uh, undue influence in our regions and constantly sabotaging the process that we want to unlock. And of course, we would like to work in cooperation with America. That's the thing. You know, we don't want a zero sum game. We want a cooperation, yeah, engagement, yeah, constructive engagement. And that's a kind of uh, uh, world we would like to see. And 
Uh, and of course, America had benefited tremendously from globalization and, 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 and integration. I don't know why it is a problem when, uh, when we raise it as a very important point. We want to trade, be able to work and get investors, select who we trade with. Uh, uh, and that is very crucial to our survival as well as our uh, uh, potential to thrive. Yeah? Uh, our future depends on this kind of engagement and... and, and, and uh, the, the manner in which this has uh, uh, taken place uh, uh, in, in the region and how America sees its position and how it wants to influence and reshape the region has been problematic. But it's not just the U.S. where we have to understand other regional powers, are, emerging powers are also uh, uh, playing a negative role, yeah? Uh, 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 and that has to be also understood in, uh, as we speak uh, the, uh, in, in how our states are being manipulated and used and abused. For example, the, the Gulf states rivalry in Somalia has been very much distractive to uh, the stability of Somalia state. Yeah? So it, it is crucial that we somehow learn to partner with others, but also recognize our priorities and, 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 and working with our neighbors. Yeah? Neighbors come first and neighborhood comes uh, as a very important route to advancing uh, home and interest at home. Interest at home you know, has to be uh, worked by, by, by working together with your neighbors. And I think African uh, uh, agenda has been exactly about that. Let's just trade with each other, let's work with each other and in that way we learn to also develop our resources uh, in a much more uh, effective fashion and benefit from it in, in a, a much more meaningful way and that I think we have to uh, uh, embrace and underline. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Binyam, uh, for that. I will throw the same question. Uh, perhaps Brother Binyam might have touched it, but in general, from the perspective of, uh, from the region's perspective, uh, Dr. Stanislav, uh, this this will be our final question for you, and then I have one more for uh, Brother Binyam as well. In light of geopolitical dynamics in the Horn of Africa. What are the potential risks uh, and challenges faced by the countries in the region? Uh, and how can they navigate these challenges to maintain uh, stability and uh, eventually achieve uh, their uh, development goals? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for this uh, final question, which is also summarizing, I think, what we were trying to discuss earlier. Um, definitely, um, in cooperation in the region, this is the only way to uh, minimize the all uh, problems, what we can see at the moment, what can be bring by uh, outstanders, uh, by the other countries who are uh, still building up their presence uh, for the different reasons. Uh, and um, yes, it will be always the uh, contradictions of interest. But let me support uh, not to say again and again the same, just support what uh, Dr. Biniam just uh, mentioned, that the neighborhood is priority. So uh, for me, as far as we can see, the inter governmental cooperation, state-to-state -state cooperation in the region. This is the only way to protect the region from any kind of bad influence from uh, from abroad. You know, many times I think that uh, uh, Africa is trying to excuse themselves, saying it's too much influence from outsiders, from the foreign powers, but you are no longer weak. You 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 have to be uh, stand in the position of partnership. It's only your government to decide to allow or not to allow the the foreign investors, the foreign military, the foreign other engagement to come to the country. And the, 
as I can see at the moment, even though, yes, Ethiopia is still suffering from some internal problem of misunderstanding, uh, because Ethiopia, it, it was built as an empire. And we, we, if we go now to the history of Ethiopia, you know better than myself, but I also spent many years there. We will come to endless uh, endless uh, story how Ethiopia was created by force, by wars, by uh, empires, and how different countries and different peoples, sorry, were brought together to stay together. But now, if we were still trying to excuse ourselves going back to our history, we will never come to the stability. Now, it's one country, one people, we have to find the common ground uh, to be united, to stop, you know, that problems in Amhara, in Oroma, they will be always uh, putting and bringing the problem to the whole country. But as far as the unity becomes priority for the countries, we wish to build this country together. This is the only way. And there is, yeah, we can accuse Americans, uh, Russians, Chinese, whatever of their influence, but I don't think w sometimes we overestimate the, that influence because uh, because the situation is completely changing now, and the, in the what I see in the new era, your uh, position is stronger in dealing with even with the China. You know, all, although African leaders have to follow and critically analyze some important concerns from the cooperation with China, but everybody now uh, understands that economic input of China to Africa is beneficial for the long term because they are building investment which you cannot afford by yourself to build roads highways and all this roads it's a it's a first priority to develop the economy but of course the there there are the, some risk the uh, sustainability and quality of chinese projects who has to examine this the government the, the locals have to examine and see if the quality is not, uh, it has to be somehow uh, addressed this issue. High public debt to Beijing, of course, it's a big threat to the future of your economy. So also the economist, local economist has to evaluate this risk and to take all measures to protect, not to be like a, in a position like Zambia, was about to be bankrupt because of unsustainable debt from China. Low labor standards. Sometimes we know like Chinese, they brought and they took your working place. But it's also the uh, it's a problem which can be addressed and can be solved. Sometimes, of course, we cannot forget uh, that and to fight the corruption, which is also brings with some Chinese companies they sometimes they are manipulating. All these risks are there, but the world is, do we want this or not? It's a global. There is no way back. So we have to adjust our position to, to these uh, global trends and to protect, first of all, the interest of, of the state. Many, uh, many, uh, you know, many, we can find many, uh, items to uh, criticize Malaz Zenawi, but let me tell you one thing. He was very pro-Ethiopian in dealing with the foreign powers. The China never was allowed to take more than they allowed to take them during his period of time. He was always uh, manipulating and he was always using U.S. against China and China against U.S. to protect the internal interests. I was witnessing of some of this process. It's a, maybe doubtful, but if you're asking the question how to protect the, the problem from, uh, from the influence from the foreign countries, it's only by 
uh, be more nationalistic and protecting their your interest. But this is the challenge. This is the way need times to overcome these problems. And once again, about the region, the region now is much more stable than it was uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Today, it's more stability, more investment, more opportunities. This, yes, Sudan, you know, when Ethiopia almost finished the Eritrean war and the, the war in Tigray, now this situation in Sudan happened, yeah. Uh, of course, the, it will again badly influence the neighbor countries. But Ethiopia, Djibouti, and uh, Eritrea, they have now to, to be united to help and to protect the borders and to solve that issue together with the African Union. African Union has to come on board and uh, act more effectively. Yeah, the challenge I hear, but my uh, personal uh, view and opinion that very positive and i think that uh, horn of africa especially as a region will develop and influence from china us middle eastern countries iran turkey if you use this influence properly and uh, address it properly will bring more dividends to the people and to the countries, then negative effects. I just want to wish my all African friends in the Horn of Africa all the success and want to say thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Stanislav. I really uh, enjoyed and was happy uh, to hear what you pointed out in terms of, you know, uh, for the region going forward, how can they tackle uh, from this uh, this problem of foreign intervention in the region? And my, the highlight for me was, listen, Africa, you are no longer weak. It all depends on your politicians to stand tall and strong uh, and say no uh, and, you know, bring that unity as a priority and the national interest as a, uh, you know, as a priority uh, agenda. Uh, and speaking of, I have one final question I said for uh, Brother Binia, which really uh, synchronized perfectly with, with what you have just said. Uh, speaking of a strong leadership and having that, uh, I don't know if courage is the right word, but standing tall and firm and, ha uh, and saying no, uh, for no bully or BS uh, from the foreign powers. One example, the only example actually in the continent is Eritrea. Uh, so, but still, uh, there are challenges that Eritrea is facing from pursuing its economy mm -hmm. goals because of this foreign involvement in the region. Now, from Eritrea's perspective, what are the potential risks and threats uh, to stability uh, in the Horn of Africa? Uh, how does Eritrea contribute to regional peace and security? Uh, and what steps does it take to address uh, the challenge and uh, promote cooperation uh, among the neighboring countries. Thank you, Marlet. And uh, uh, thank you, Doctor. I think that's a very important note here. Yeah? We have to remember that we are going to overcome those challenges we have today, and our future is increasingly becoming brighter. Yeah? Despite the contemporary challenges we face, I think the future is promising as uh, the Dr. Sanslav has said, yeah. So it, it is important for us to embrace that and, you know, use that momentum to uh, uh, somehow shape our drive uh, as we engage with each other. Now, coming to what Eritrea uh, can do and should do in, in, this, in this regard. Uh, for me, I think uh, uh, it's not just what Eritrea should do, but rather how cooperatively regional states should do. Yeah? 
and uh, uh, and and bringing those regional states in uh, and engaging with each other at different layers now it's not just now people talk about leader to leader no people to people engagement a cultural exchange the uh, uh, public diplomacy aspect to it military to military uh, engagement and i think we have seen the do uh, uh, documentary about Eritrean generals and Eritrean soldiers working with Ethiopian soldiers that have been interviewing each other, you know, they're discussing how they went about it and how cooperatively they work together. I think that's a very important indicator that uh, we are working together with each other. And then, of course, when you bring in Somalia into it, it's not just about Eritrea and Ethiopia, but you bring in a uh, 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 Kenya and all the others, it would help stabilize Somalia as well if you bring Eritrea and uh, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, I mean Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, working together to stabilize Somalia. And if they stabilize Somalia, and it's also a lot easier to stabilize South Sudan, you bring in Ju uh, uh, Uganda into the fold as well. So then it goes to stabilizing Sudan, uh, 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 North Sudan as well. So working with the regional state to facilitate. Remember, any problem, any problem that you face, it comes only from your neighbor. Remember, if there are insurgencies, they come through your neighbor. If there are destabilizing forces, they come through your neighbor. That's the kind of uh, a, a usual pattern that we have seen. Yeah? So if all states are working together to address this, then uh, uh, and build trust and, uh, and foster a, a, a kind of uh, cooperative mood, yeah? uh, I, as, as opposed to rivalry and you know, a, a zero-sum game. Remember, uh, 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 the U.S. had been trying to play Kenya and Ethiopia by saying, oh, you will be my anchor state, and then you know, then moving into Kenya, Kenya becomes the anchor state. Instead of using them as riv rivals, yeah? And, for example, Djibouti, seeing Eritrea port being used by Ethiopia is going to weaken it Ethiopia's usage of Djibouti's ports. And no, Ethiopia, when it grows, then it's going to need way many ports. And it's not just Ethiopia, but then the rest of Africa, the hinterlands, even all the way to West Africa is going, are going to need a lot more ports and effective big ports. So it's not a zero-sum game. We don't have to compete with each other. We can't have a healthy competition, but rather we can work cooperatively to facilitate and unlock those potentials. Yeah, That's very important. And the other element which I think many of our leaders had been talking about, uh, regional economic integration would, re would allow us to see how integrated we are and would allow us to somehow uh, notice our, inter our interests are intertwined. Yeah, and that's very important. Even at the national level, if communities are integrated if, through infrastructure development, through uh, a social infrastructure, not a physical, but, but also uh, uh, the social infrastructure developed, uh, that would allow them to see their interests are integrated, yeah, intertwined. And, and therefore, you don't see them as an enemy or you don't see them as rival. Rather, uh, you are in it together. Okay, that's very crucial. The other important element, which I always press on is we need to learn to develop a common narrative that we need yeah we have to have a common narrative if we emphasize on what is dividing us what's wrong with us we're going to just widen the gap where we see strengths where we see the positive we need to make it stand out yeah build a common narrative we we'll all share and a positive one and that would i think uh, lead us to a better future but i see some are invested in the, the negative some are invested in what is dividing us yeah a divisive agendas and i think if we move away from those divisive agendas and start talking about a common narrative that we need to uh, uh, establish and foster and then that 
would facilitate a better future that we can all benefit from in the region and in each individual state and communities. Thank you very much, Mahalit, once again. And uh, I'm also glad to have shared this platform with Dr. Stanislav. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, really, uh, both of you, Dr. Stanislav, uh, Dr. Biniam. Uh, I, I always enjoy uh, having you here. And uh, yeah, it's every day, it's a learning uh, for me. Uh, with that being said, really, uh, we have touched uh, many things. I think a synopsis uh, of the past six decades, what happened in the region and kind of um, also you have pointed out how uh, the region uh, can pursue its economic growth uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Have, good, uh, have a good evening. Uh, and those of you who have he who were here tuned for the past one hour uh, and 35 minutes to be exact, uh, thank you very much. So for us, you may support our, our channel, of course, through our PayPal account, but more so you can support us as soon as this stream is through uh, by sharing this video with your network because information uh, uh, is important and knowledge we need to empower each other so please share it don't keep it just for yourself uh, yeah uh, thank you very much uh, we try actually to do this uh, at, at least in every other week every friday i i plan to have this uh, with you uh, so, you know, we can all discuss the agenda uh, or what the topic can be. And you, our viewers, also what you would like to know in the region, what you want us to discuss here uh, every Friday, uh, what Dr. Binam and Dr. Stanislav can bring to you. You may suggest also a topic in the comment section. So, yeah, uh, CNDS, Black, uh, Dr. Hermon, uh, Nakura, uh, if I pronounce it good, uh, G-Z-E, I would say just G-Z-E, yeah. Uh, thank you all really for your comments uh, and questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, that's it for me. Uh, I can give you a few seconds if you want to say anything to the viewers. Uh, yeah. Yeah, nothing to say. Continue to support this program and really appreciate your presence and contribution. Thank you. Same here. Thank you very much. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for supporting. And Mahala, thank you for this, uh, to organize us to be here. Thank you very <laughs> thank much. You. Thank you very, very yeah. much also for your suggestion yeah. as well. So, yeah, yeah, have a good evening. Thank you for your time. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Good evening and good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.